everybody. We are live. Welcome. I, I, I thought I thought I was gonna uh, open. You got you got uh, Anna's uh, information all squared away there and everything, Josh. Yep, we got it. All right, great. So we are back again live with the uh, daily noon uh, podcast, video cast, Facebook Live, whatever you want to call this uh, thing. We are uh, here with an exciting guest, Anna Kelly, REI mom. She's a coach. She is a real estate investor. She is a mom. She is a taxi driver to four children uh, to many a sundry events. And she is a great lady to know. We've been talking about financing all this week. And Anna is, um, what I really like about Anna is she spent 15 years, 20 years. How many years did you work for AIG? 20. 20 years. So she's, I, I didn't want to date you there. I was, I was a little nervous about, so Anna spent, uh, old, I'm getting old, but I'm not nice. halfway there. <laughs> so she spent, uh, 20 years. Um, and before that had, you know, other, many other uh, business successes in the banking world, working for other banks, uh, on, on even a smaller level. So she's a great guest. We'll get Anna. we're going to get to you in a second, but uh, we, we always start with like three to five minutes worth of news. And so today, Josh and I were talking before we got the show started. There is really conflicting data out there about the housing market right now. Some yeah. is actually kind of positive right now. We, we don't want to be accused of putting lipstick on a pig uh, yeah. or anything like that or being Cinderella and just pretending everything's looking good. But Josh, your, your quote before the show was, we might totally miss the downturn as we ramp back up. And by the time we're fully ramped back up, we could, we could miss a, a major dip in pricing. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah. So I, um, I've been, I've been watching the housing market since, uh, you know, probably 2010 waiting for like this time in history, you know, I mean, I, I have been kind of gauging where, you know, when to jump in, when to buy. And over the last couple of years, I a major dip in pricing. What, what are your thoughts? Well, so Josh, I, I you got something. You got something going on, my friend. No, I got no nothing running in the background. Um, Anna, do you have uh, Facebook running? I just shared the live. So oh, that's my what we were hearing. <laughs> I have it turned down now. Oh, okay, sorry. great, awesome, awesome. No, hey, no, we're, no. we're happy to happy to have the uh, the extra eyeballs. Yes, absolutely, and uh, honestly, the. Um, the audio gets a little bit screwed up with the software sometimes. So anyway, long story short, I've been looking at the housing market and waiting. I thought that the presidential election would be the impetus for kind of the change in, in the market. I thought we'd see a downturn after the election, but you know, with COVID it changed everything, right? You know, right. It, it kind of expedited it. And, and for a while here, I've been waiting for a major drop in pricing, but there's some real indicators that, we might have higher housing pr prices coming out of this. And depending on how the, um, the employment market, um, you know, and, and small business is fair, if some of the incentives that might come out from government, you know, I think we might even miss a downturn. I mean, like we might totally skip it. Anna, what are your thoughts? You know, I will say this, just as I predict something, the Fed jumps in to do something to completely change what I think is going to happen. And that's not how it used to be, you know, like in 2008, 2009, the Fed kind of let the mark, the mortgage market do its thing and, and have its meltdown. So there's been a lot of things that make me really, really nervous um, as as an investor, um, but also let me think there's going to be great opportunity. And then some things change. So in the, the, the thing that maybe changed my mind a little bit was, you know, all these people that went into forbearance initially, I thought you know, after 90 days or, you know, a year for some where the, the lender is actually still the servicer, people are going to have to pay a huge chunk of, of money and not be able to do that and go into foreclosure. Yep. Then the Fed kind of said, hey, if it's agency backed, you have to modify, you have to let them tack it on the back end. Mm -hmm. And now they've come in this week and said, you know, not only um, do you have to do that, but you can't keep people from getting a new loan or refinancing as long as they pay on time for three months and get back at it. And so all of those kind of things are making it less likely that there's going to be this huge wave of foreclosures and that yep. banks are going to have to work with, with borrowers to get back on their feet. And so I think that's, it's a great thing for homeowners and, and borrowers and maybe prevent some of, of the, you know, huge decline that we thought we would be in. 
With that said, I do still think we were heading for a recession and that there were fundamental underlying issues within the economy that a lot of people don't understand and that weren't reported on that showed we were heading there anyway. And so I think with all of the job losses and, and layoffs that are starting and I think are going to continue, I still think we're going to hit a recession. I don't think we're going to have this quick bounce. I hope you know that we do. But what I'm starting to see, Judah, is a lot of time as, as these employers have huge hits in their business income, they're becoming more lean. And as also they're seeing that they can operate with less people, they're starting to have a large swath of layoffs. So quite a few big employers just in the last few days have announced a cut of you know 20 to 40% of their staff. Yeah. And so I think it's gonna be more difficult in certain areas of the country where people weren't already working remotely for them to just jump over and find a same job in their industry and in their location. So I think the unemployment is what's going to really cause a recession to to maybe be a little deeper and last a little longer than what we might think. But again, I don't have a crystal ball. Things change daily. And, you know, I'm just kind of committed to let's let's keep watching what's happening. Watch for the opportunities when they come. Don't think it may last a long time. It may not. Yeah. Um, and, and the lendings, you know, deals may be available and the lendings what's going to be harder for a while until we, we reset. So it's just a matter of of when. Um, that's going to happen. Sure. Yeah, that's that, that's really good insight there, Anna. And one of the things that I love about having you on as, as a guest. Uh, so the the you said something there about um, you know business is getting more lean, and I think that that's that's very important. I've got an example of that. But as you guys are coming on, just so you know, uh, Josh wrote a book called um, Real Estate Hackers. And property. for property hackers, oh, yeah. sorry, real estate yeah. hackers oh, yeah. is the name of the show. Property <laughs> hackers is a book that uh, Josh wrote. And for the best comment or question today, why we're interviewing Anna, we're going to give away that book. We've been giving away books all week, and so yeah. feel free to comment, and we will. It, 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 whether it's the best comment or not, we will probably also read it on air. But then we'll be giving one away. So feel free to do that. I think that a good example of companies kind of streamlining is uber so they've just recently laid off 3500 employees and what's interesting about that is you think well uber doesn't have any employees because everybody's a private contractor well uber was in the the um uh you know the driveless car industry and the um you know software associated with that uber was like a 30 billion dollar company and still potentially as I, I haven't checked their market cap recently but they have a lot of employees and they've laid a bunch of people off who weren't in their core business. And I think that that is a microcosm of what a lot of other businesses are going to be doing. During good, flush financial times like we've had for the past 10 years, well, seven years, six years, whatever it's been, you know, since the bottoming out there uh, during the Obama years that Trump has certainly ridden up. We've seen a lot of businesses diversifying and doing a bunch of other things. And so a business can, quote unquote, be doing fine, but still shed a lot of its, um, you know, preliminary or, excuse me, you know, periphery uh, businesses and focus on its core business. And therefore, uh, so businesses might look more profitable. They might be doing better in their core businesses, but they will be employing less people. And, and yeah. that, that's be how that all that. shakes out. Yeah, the same thing with AIG in, in 2009. You know, I kept thinking I'm losing my job, I'm losing my job, but my division was so complicated they couldn't sell it, quite frankly, which is why I didn't lose my job. But lots and lots of people lost lost their jobs. And what happens is when a company like that, during good times, they're buying, there's mergers, there's acquisitions. And so they're taking on these companies prospectively thinking we can turn these companies around. But in, for the first few years, there's a lot of money poured into those divisions that aren't really making money. And I yeah. just saw an article a week or two ago that AIG is divesting of a group that they just recently acquired. And it's for that same reason. So that group of people that are really niched into what they do will lose jobs. And so what happens is I know the fear for me back when I worked for AIG is what I did was so specialized that I thought I can't find another job like this without relocating to, to a major city. So I think that's going to continue to happen just because companies have to get leaner. They're going to let go of those specialized areas, exactly like what you said. And those are the employees that are going to be hit. And those markets that that house those employees, if they're not already kind of tech and remote, 
those markets are going to see bigger, longer lasting dips and, and, you know, kind of micro recessions where they are. And that as real estate investors is where we're going to see opportunities. So we have to be watchful and say, you know, even if it doesn't happen everywhere and last a long time, there's going to be pockets where there's opportunities where we can create win-win situations for those people that are laid off and maybe take advantage of those opportunities in a, in a good way. Yep. It's, it's kind of interesting, too, that, you know, because we've had such a rolling, a, a good rolling economy and there's been so much capital that in, in every market, you know, a lot of these um, a lot of these companies, when they start divestifying, they were or, excuse me, divestifying. divestifying. That's a good one. <laughs> I keep talking. I'm going to Google that and, uh, and see if I can get the proper spelling on divestifying. <laughs> well, they started picking up. Um, different, like smaller companies that were, um, you know, in, in some way related, but they're, they're more tangential. And now, I mean, all of a sudden, it's not as if this was a downturn in the economy. This was like emergency brake pulled going 70 miles an hour down the highway. And so you, you have a lot of this, a lot of this reactionary type behavior where, you know, if, if people are, uh, or if companies had enough equity or enough capital in hand, they could ride out this wave and really come out ahead of the, the curve here. But most companies have been operating on these thin margins or no margins, especially tech. You know, I mean, a lot of these companies, they, they weren't profitable to begin with. And now you add the, the, the economy, it's a really different story. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons I truly believed we would be heading toward a recession and see a stock market correction. So I know that's not really our focus today, but, you know, most of these companies right now, the, their stock price compared to their PE uh, ratio is significantly higher than the intrinsic value of those companies. And if you look yeah. at the debt and the way that they move debt around to not look like debt on their balance sheets, um, there, there's a lot of risk there if you don't have constant money feeding the machine and paying their debt, which is part of why the Fed slashed rates. It wasn't really about real estate at the time. They started doing it because they need to be able to provide companies with liquidity at low rates to cover their debt and to stay afloat and not have mass unemployment and mass layoffs. And so the government's doing all, all that they can, pulling out all the stops to kind of keep it going. But in some ways, there's a house of cards in our economy with a lot of big corporations who have a ton of debt, just like a lot of these municipalities. And so when we talk about you know, what's coming in the future, you see all these layoffs, you see companies that have a lot of debt. It may be tough to sell and to finance some of those businesses, even if they want to divest of them. Yeah. Um, and, and so you, know, you just got a lot going on. And the longer this goes that they can't make income. You know, in Pennsylvania, we just reopened certain areas and, and real estate, um, for example. But the longer COVID goes, the worse it's going to be, you know, in terms of how how quick of a bounce do we have? And one of the things, I'm an eternal optimist, by the way. So for me, Amen, to sister. About, for me to even talk about, you know, negativity, it's because I really see some things that are are reality that we can't bury our head in the sand and say, oh, it's it's all going to be great. But yet, I'm still hopeful, and I think we can make the best, you know, of every situation and find opportunities in every deal. Yeah. Okay. So so. Um... Uh, we, I wanted to spend like, you know, three to five minutes talking about the news and getting your reaction to it. Um, and, and we've kind of blown right into the content portion of the show, which is great. But I don't want to go another minute without you telling everybody uh, your 45 second commercial. Who is Anna Kelly and why do you have credibility to be on, on, on the air talking to us today? Sure. So, Judah, thank you so much again for having me. You know, I've been in the financial services sector for about 25 years. So I started out in private banking talking to the wealthiest clients in our bank about how they should invest their money in different you know, investment vehicles, then started working for AIG, where I primarily worked with the, the top and wealthiest clients in the country, their advisors and companies and banks who bought private banking insurance with hedge funds, with complicated investments and syndications and that type of thing. So I have a, a breadth of knowledge and experience when it comes to just the financial sector and the different types of investments that have really helped me along the way as a real estate investor. So as an investor, started out you know, buying a couple of properties on the side to try to replace my income and stay home with my babies. And you know, over a very long journey through the ups and downs of the collapse of 08 and 09, working for a company, AIG, that was about to go under, I really had to learn how to dig myself out and look at markets, figure out how to react and figure out how to make something happen. So by the grace of God, I retired. Um, financially independent, 
uh, doing pretty well. You know, I, I own and asset manage a little over 500 apartment units, and then I've invested in about 2,000 passively. So that's a little bit about me and, and just the things I've learned over time. That is absolutely uh, amazing. And we'll get your contact information. Actually, if we could put it up now, we'll talk about this more later. But mm -hmm. Anna is also uh, a coach on a very limited basis. She's, she's looking, uh, she doesn't take on more than uh, 10 students at a time. And she's got some openings. It's one of the things that I find very admirable about you is you're not looking to build some big coaching empire and then just have people in Utah uh, reading off scripts how to answer uh, questions. <laughs> You're right. actually interested in, in getting involved with people and, and, and helping them coach and things like that. So um, I, I love your I love your REI mom brand. I mean, I love it. my uh, I've, I've brought this up on a couple of different shows, but I've tried to get my wife involved in real estate so many times. But it really it feels a lot of times like a male dominated you know world sometimes, at least it is. The face, right? Exactly. <laughs> it, you know, and, and you know, I shared your I shared your website with her, and like we had a bunch of conversations about getting her involved. It was really great. It was really awesome. So thanks. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm really impassioned about helping women because it was hard for me to get started, and very few women actually invest in real estate. So the number of even passive investors who get involved in real estate it's significantly more men. Uh, because a lot of women just don't think about it, don't have the tools and the resource to do it. So that's why I coach, you know, to Judah's point, I'll never make more money coaching than I do real estate. Like real estate's my thing. I love it. But yep. the reason I love it is because it created financial freedom for me so that I can live the life I want to with my family, make them my priority, spend my time, you know, with them and not time, you know, just working my, you know, slaving myself away for a job and trading time for dollars. So empowering women and anybody to really create financial freedom is what my coaching program is really all about. That's yeah, great. I've been a full time real estate investor. I quit my job when I was like 23, 24, and certainly had some ups and downs since then. Started my real estate uh, investor club at like 26. And it, it it's been something that I've done because it's been a labor of love because Anna, tell me if you don't experience this, when other people have poured into you and you have success and flexibility and freedom because of it, you just have this uncontrollable desire to give to other people. Yeah. And until you experience it, you that sounds hokey. That sounds like it's a line. It sounds like you're covering for you're really actually trying to make money. And that's just the excuse. But it really is just about helping people, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and Judah, you know, I I will just give you a, a quick, you know, 30 second commercial for Judah. But, you know, Judah was the first real estate investment group that I went to ever and you know, met Judah and he just has a heart to give, give, give. So I don't know that you've ever made money or monetized your group, but faithfully every month for years, Judah holds a real estate investment seminar teaching people how to do real estate in different ways for free and really has become a really good friend. And through that investment club and creating a network and, and getting to know other investors is really what helped me to see, I can't just keep doing this on my own. I've got to connect with other really good people. And once I did and quit being a Lone Ranger, you know, my life changed and, and the financial trajectory of my, my family changed. And so I owe a lot of that to your friendship and your meetup group and the network that I developed as, as a part of that. So it's Thank really- Thank you very fun. much. And I, I also, by the way, I also, not to toot my own horn here, but just as an example of networking anywhere, you were posting on Facebook that you recently did a real estate uh, transaction with somebody who I think you met at my club. Am I correct about that? I honestly don't know. You're both members of my club, whether or not you met there or through, so you know, through the uh, Central PA Real Estate Investor uh, Facebook group or whatever. But yeah, I mean, that's that's what I love to do. It's just it's just yeah. connect people. And Anna, I make money, you know, tangentially uh, through through the club. I mean, I've done a couple loans for you over the years, and I do loans for other people. And I've I've just listed a house last night. I'm getting ready to list one again today for you know club members. So it's, it makes me money in a very indirect way, but let's, 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 uh, so thank you very much for that. I want to, I want to turn things back over to content here. And yeah. as a new investor right now in 2020, I think a great way for people to get started is, is something that you've perfected. And I think that it's going to become an even better way to invest moving forward. And that's house hacking. 
buying two, three, and four unit buildings. So for the new person out there who's done less than two or three deals, do you think that house hacking is a good way to invest? Do you think that it's going to become a, a more viable way because investors have been gobbling up a lot of those deals that first time home buyers haven't been able to buy them? And and what do you what do you think about that moving forward? If that's not too easy of a, of, a, of a line of questioning. No, absolutely. I think it's very, very, very powerful. And I, it is the first thing that I tell anybody I coach. If you don't already own a home or if you can give up the home that you own, house hack. If you can house hack a four unit apartment building, you know, for us, we made a huge sacrifice. We moved from a big single family home in Texas with two kids and moved into a small two bedroom apartment with two babies. And we house hacked and we developed tenants. And the reason that I did it is because we were moving to PA, starting an, ex an expensive business with lots of debt and a trial basis work from home job. So my, fin my finances were somewhat unstable. And I said, I need to, number one, protect ourselves, not go in for a big mortgage and a big sexy house so that I can say I have a nice house and feel good, but protect myself because things might not stay stable. And thank God I house hacked because a year later, the economy started to crash and I had those three tenants paying my full mortgage, all of my insurance, and I basically got to live for free off the other three units. And so if you have any question about financial instability, you're worried about your job right now, and you want to get started in real estate, you can do both by house hacking. And the amazing thing is you can get amazing financing. So we're talking about financing today. You can get amazing financing up to 100% financing, even still today through the USDA housing program, or three and a half percent down through the FHA program. And you will not find that through anything else other than house hacking, because any other investment property if you're going through a bank, you got to put at least 20 to 25% down. Yeah. Yeah. USDA is geographically um, uh, specific, right? So, so you've got to be in certain tracts of land and it's very easy to go to the USDA website and there's a map where you can just plug in the address. And if it's, I forget which way it is. If it's if, if the dot is on yellow, then it's good. If it's on if it's on white, then it's not, or vice versa. But it has to be in a somewhat rural tract of land. And just to give you an idea, about half of Lancaster County is USDA considers rural. About half of Lancaster County they don't consider rural. And so even in Lancaster County, there's some places that are not rural enough, but that are rural enough. So if you can find a four unit that's in the USDA, that will give you a of uh, a 100% financing option. You so, can also you can also do an FHA. We only have to put three and a half percent down. Yeah. Donna, when, when you moved from Texas, right? What were you looking for? I mean, were were you specifically looking for a multi-unit that you could house hack and and you know, or was this just hey, like this seems like a pretty good investment? We were looking for a house and it just happened to pop up and work out that way. No. So I was looking for, you know, we were, we were selling everything we had. We were starting my husband's business. So the first year we actually moved in with my in-laws with two babies, God bless them. They helped us while we were starting my husband's business and we were, you know, and it had apartments. So when we bought my husband's office space, instead of leasing, we bought instead of leasing because we, it had three apartments and four garages with it. And yeah. I said, wow, we've had a year where we've had a lot of our mortgage covered by these other tenants. And I had had a rental property in Texas too. And I said, you know, it'd be really smart. We're outgrowing this. My in-laws have been gracious enough. You know, it's time to get a house. And I said, you know, with everything that I wanted a house and I was tired of living with in-laws and selling my house, I said, the wise thing to do is let's buy something else where tenants are paying for our mortgage. And so I knew we didn't have a lot of money, but we had enough for three and a half percent down, um, which is why I didn't look to buy a single family. So I saw a four unit come on the market just as I was looking for maybe renting a house. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow, this is a really decent place. We can make it a little nicer and a little bigger and we can have the benefit of rental income covering our expenses. And so I just decided, let's just do it. And I'm, I'm so glad I did. That's awesome. Anna. You know, I, I, you, I've been your friend for 10 years plus, and mm -hmm. I've, I've heard you because you've spoken, you know, a number of times that I've, I've uh, invited you to and promoted and just other times I've heard you speak. I, I, it's never too late to start over. I mean, right. if I could do the math right here and forgive me for talking about your age for a second, but you were like 35 with two babies moving into your in-laws house for a year. Like, the humility that that takes, 
the, the, the willingness to be humble, by the way, Anna, John is my sister and you guys are best friends that haven't met yet. You've, you've, you've got to, I'll get you hooked up with her later. So the humility that it takes to say, you know what, I'm going to take two steps back so that I can take eight steps forward. You know, yeah. there's not a lot of people who would be willing to um, move in with their in-laws at 35 and, and swallow that pride to do that because you know what made the most financial sense. But there's also a whole lot of people who would give their right arm to have fractional ownership and control over 2,000 units by yeah. 45. You know right. what I mean? That trade-off right. is amazing if you stop and think about it. Yeah, and I think part of what made me feel that that was a good thing to do, Judah, is because when I first had my baby in 2003, you know, I was at the top of my career moving up. My husband, you know, finished chiropractic college and thought he was going to make all this money as an entrepreneur. Um, we flipped a house because I wanted to be. Are you saying with- entrepreneurs don't just automatically make a lot of money? No. Are you? Are, I mean, is that breaking news? <laughs> I, I am saying that is true. And it's like the worst thing we ever did was start a business that was in real estate. Time for another story. But, you know, when I went to, to, I wanted to be home with my baby. And so I flipped a house and we did the flipping the house thing totally wrong because we just watched HGTV and thought we can do it. And it yep. was a, a lot harder than we thought. During that time, we had followed the American dream. I had taught the American dream. I did, you know, we we bought a house, we bought a car, uh, we, we were flipping a property and my husband lost his job during that time. And it took us a year to sell it. So we had two mortgages, a car payment, a new baby, a, a, a expensive school loan. And we were like rice and beans thinking we were gonna collapse financially. So through that experience of that year of that house not selling, it actually ended up being a blessing because it taught me we can't live so tight. We can't have all this stuff and all these things to show for it and be struggling emotionally, financially, you know, just the stress of that. So I thought, you know, I'm, I'm willing to take a step back to give up the house, to give up expensive cars. We had a nice Mercedes and we had a Honda and I just, I ended up selling the Mercedes. We sold the house and we said, let's start over. And this time we're going to do it the right way. We're going to do it slowly carefully, not overextend ourselves. Now we overextend ourselves to start a business, but everything personally, we backed off so that we could, you know, put everything that we had into the business. That's a great, yeah, that's, I, absolutely, I love that part of, uh, of your story that it's never, it's never too late to, to start over. And I think the, I think the advice there that you gave uh, to, you know, everybody that, just before we were talking about that, about starting and house hacking, it can be a great way. And when you house hack, you know, you did some work to kind of force appreciation mm-hmm. on, on your house hacks, but there's also a, a fair number of house hacks that come out there available that you don't necessarily need to rehab, correct? Absolutely. And, you know, what I tell people in terms of, you know, what's right for you, the most important thing is that you have to look at yourself and say, do I have more time or do I have more money? And if you have no money, like we did, we didn't, we just had a lot of debt we had to put in the time and we had to buy an uglier property that needed a little more work. And we had to put in that sweat equity, you know, learn to swing a hammer, learn what we didn't know. And we only hired out the things that we really had to like plumbing and electrical. But I mean, I painted so much that I'll never, ever, ever painted. (laughs) I'll pay anybody anything to paint because I had to learn the hard way. But if you have cash and you don't have time, then buy something a little lot nicer and make it easier. You know, so another thing that I did right after the four unit we bought, so we bought it just before the collapse of the market. We bought it in early 08 and then things with AIG started to teeter in September of 08. So when they did, I was wiped out my 401k. I was heavily invested in AIG stock and other financial stocks because I didn't understand markets and what was going on. I lost a ton. And I took my 401k and I took a a $50,000 loan because I was left with not much more than that. Took a $50,000 loan and I used it to buy another four unit that didn't need as much work because I said, I may lose my job. I've already lost tons of my retirement account. I don't want any more in the market, but this thing with my rentals has gone pretty well for a couple months and I need another $1,500 a month to put food on the table if I lose my job at AIG. So I, I took that down payment on another four unit that didn't need much work other than one unit. And it was the best thing that I could have done with that money. And it's really what, what kind of catapulted me to realize the safety of a corporate career, even with one of the biggest com- companies in the world, is not really what it's cracked up to be. 
the safety of the stock market that I thought was super safe and taught people was safe over the long term was not what it was cracked up to be. And being an entrepreneur with tons and tons of debt and a halt to income was not what it was cracked up to be. The only thing that was working was my small rental properties. And it's what catapulted me to say, this is the path forward to create financial freedom where I can understand the risk. I can figure out how to finance them and I can create financial freedom. So, all right. So you, you started with one house hack, then took a loan from your 401k to do your second property. When did you, when that was done, you know, how do you, how do you transition to 500 units, 2000 units passively? You know, how do you, how do you take that leap? And, and you know what, better yet, how, where'd you find the, the, the next deposit, you know, the, the next deposit on the next house and how did, how did you continue to grow with that? So this was the difficulty and why I'm so excited to start helping people right now, because yeah. the same thing that happened in 09 to people is what's happening right now. And it's going to look very much like what my story did. I didn't figure it out as quickly as I should have. I wish that I had been more resilient, had the network much sooner. But yeah. what I did was the banks immediately started saying no. The day I just posted something on Facebook about this this morning or last night, the day of the settlement of that, that third four unit building that I took my 401k to buy, a huge bank um, pulled the deal. The day of settlement, we're, yep. not, we're not settling. You're too risky. They saw I worked for AIG, somebody very high up that was like in their final control, checking off the loan before they sent the wire said no. And it was devastating. I thought, man, I know I don't look good on paper. I used to help wealthy clients get mortgages. I've done subprime lending. I understood that I didn't look good on paper, but I just was like, this is my only hope is this new four unit. I've got to do it. So I had to get resourceful. I found a small local bank that funded me, you know, took a while, but we got it. We got it done. I paid ton in points, a much higher interest rate, but I got it done. After that, every bank that I talked to said, no, I thought all I got to do is buy some more four unit rentals. There were several on the market. If I can just get to them and figure out how to fund them, then I can keep growing. But every bank, every bank said no, big banks, small banks. A lot of the local banks were stopping to lend to any real estate investors on any residential property. So it wasn't necessarily, yes, I looked bad on paper, but the market for real estate investors, the lending tightened and it's already starting to happen today in some ways. And so I was stagnated for a couple of years. I didn't buy anything else. I said, I don't know how to do it. I didn't know about private money. I didn't know about hard money. I mm -hmm. didn't know about creative financing. I only knew what I knew. And even though I had a pretty good financial background, if you don't know what you don't know, you're going to go slow. And, and I went slow because of what I didn't know. And the truth of the matter is a couple years later, I still had my job with AIG we knew that eventually banks would say yes. So we spent all of our time making those units nicer. We said, we'll just keep making them nicer. We'll keep raising the rents. And as soon as I can, as soon as banks say yes again, I'll have equity that we can use to grow. So I kept asking banks like every six months, will you rent, lend on equity from rental properties? At that point, I was renting a house. I, so I moved out of my house hack, didn't have equity in my own home. And the banks kept saying no. One of them finally said yes. So I knew I was back in the game, but it took me three years to figure it out. So I knew I had a lender. I decided to go to a meetup group. I knew I need a network. I need to find ways to find deals without banks. Three years of no was enough to get me to say, you know, light a fire under me. And I went to Judah's meeting. And I kid you not, Judah, I don't know if you know this, but the very first meetup group that I went to, Dave Licadello stood up. I was going to say, you met Dave. I, rem I remember I remember this happening. Yes. I remember this happening. And I remember you calling me afterwards and saying, Judah, is this guy a good guy, bad guy? What do you think? And yeah, well, I, I, I remember that. Three unit property for sale right out 10 minutes from my house. And if anybody's interested, come let me know. And I walked up to him because I had studied a little bit about owner financing, but I'm like, I need to figure, I need to meet people that have done it. And I, I went up to him and said, hey, would you consider selling it on terms for the right buyer with strong credit, good background, et cetera? He's like, yeah, let's talk. So I went, I got into books. I went on bigger pockets. I looked how to structure a seller finance deal. And I went with my paperwork and I met with them, walked the property and I said, okay, with, with all the confidence externally, but like <laughs> internally, I don't <laughs> convince this guy to do it. I said, 
this is what I have to offer. This is how I can save you capital gains on your property. Cause I knew he didn't want to take the capital gains hit. And lo and behold, he had already done some seller financing deals for people. So that one deal, that first meetup group I went back to gave me the confidence that I can actually do this. I called my dad. I borrowed the down payment of $10,000, paid my dad interest. So I got in for 100% financing through creative financing and a private loan from my dad. And that gave me the confidence that I could do it again. And I did another four unit the next month and another four unit the next month with owner financing. And that's when I said, I can do this. I can scale it. Now I just have to create a five year plan to execute it and find every sourcing deal that I can and every way to do a deal creatively that I can. And that's what got me off to the races. I, I got to ask you, you, you mentioned four units multiple times during this conversation. Why four units? I mean, it, it, did it just so happen that, it, you know, you stumbled on these or was this a strategy that you were looking at? So I didn't know it was a strategy at the time, but now I'm like, this was a really good strategy. <laughs> so I knew that I wanted to get into multifamily and I had gone to an event where I learned to do big multifamily deals. The woman ended up being a total fraud. Judah told me she probably would be, and she was, should have listened to him. But I learned at least there was power in investing in multi-units. And I had already had two. So I think I went to the event right before I bought the third one when AIG was crashing or, or you know, between the time I, I found it and I closed. So I knew, man, there's power in investing in multiple units at the same time because you just get a bigger bang for the buck all at once instead of buying one single family home at a time. And I knew that if I bought a single and the tenant was out, it could cost me a lot of money. But in a four unit in my market, I could have one vacant at all times and still make my mortgage payment. So I knew it was you know, fairly more profitable. But what I saw in my market just outside of Hershey, it's a pretty small market. There's not a lot of supply, but there's a lot of demand. But investors just weren't looking for deals here. Everybody was scooping up the singles and flipping them. And everybody was going to big apartments, but nobody was buying the four units. They sat on the market for six months a year. And I was the only buyer that was coming in and going, your property's been on the market for nine months. I can make you a deal. Let's figure out how to make this happy. I'm sure you want to sell it. And that was my sweet spot was seeing where is nobody else buying and how can I make that my niche and make money doing it? And that's how I decided to buy four units. That is a, that's really interesting. And I had the exact same experience with marketing for wholesale deals. I found that like four to like 10 units, nobody pays attention to when you get right. above that, you know, you're talking about much bigger money and below that, every, you know, a lot more small investors, but that's, that's really interesting. It's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's great. Well, listen, we have got to, we have got to wrap this up, but Anna, I just want you to, I want to circle back to one thing that we've gotten a couple comments on here. Uh, Jonna says that uh, stuff uh, is what is strangling your budget. Your stuff is strangling your budget. And Taz says, it's why the middle class is the middle class because the middle class has a bunch of things. So yeah. talk to me about what, what, are, what, what are your thoughts on that? And what are your thoughts on the, the, the importance of uh, controlling your expenditures and, and not uh, buying doodads uh, as anybody who's probably that cash flow understands that term. It's so, so important because it doesn't matter if you're going to a bank or if you're going to a private lender or if you're going to a hard money lender all lenders want to see that you have some stability. They're not just going to give you a ton of money. When you're at the top of the market, lenders will do some crazy things just to get people to lend to, and they'll give you free money. But when you get to the bottom of a market, they're looking at their risk significantly tighter than they did before. And so if you have no cash and no reserves and you want to be a real estate investor, they're going to laugh at you and say, you have no cash and no reserves. And so you've got to, you've got to do creative deals and hope that you don't need a lender if you don't have any cash. But the only way you get cash is by giving up stuff. So for us, it was living with my in-laws a year and then it was living in a four unit. And then instead of buying a house, we rented a house. I rented a much nicer house than I could have owned and I didn't have to give up the down payment. So instead, I used every bit of money that I made as down payments on more rental property instead of down payments on a nice house. We drove a 10 year old car. We bought a rusty Dodge truck for our work that my husband drove for 10 years while we had we had been developed into multimillionaires through our property. And my husband was still driving a rusty junk beat up truck. Yeah. I don't go buy little things that I want. You know, um, I have couches that are 
have stains from my kids and I cover it up with nice pillows, but I'm not going to go spend two grand on new couches that my kids are going to mess up again when I can put that toward putting together a deal. So living below your means for a while until you develop enough cash flow that you are you're, you're decreasing risk because you have a few months expenses saved up in case something goes bad with your rental properties or your life, you're in no position to really be buying rental property, at least without risk. And you certainly won't be able to get the financing for it if you don't, if you don't learn to live below your means while you are live while you are learning to expand your means. That's the key. Yeah. I, I, you know, looked at my budget about this time last year and I just did a three month audit of my budget. And I realized that my meals out, not meals with clients, not meals, you know, whatever, just my straight up meals out were a thousand dollars a month. Yeah. And I mean, like, I, now I have four kids. So when I go out to eat, like, you know, it's a lot to begin with. Uh, and, I, and I just, I just said, you know what, from, from now until I do this, this, and this, I set myself benchmarks. I said, until this happens in my life, this happens in my life. And this happens in my life. I am not spending $1 out to eat that I don't have to. If right. I can eat, if I can eat a meal at home, if I can make a meal at home, I'm going to. And and that was not a big deal. I mean, imagine, I know, I know it's kind of ubiquitous that people talk about, you know, pizza Friday nights. They, you know, they, they're, you know, you know, we get, we get pizza. If you look at what two pizzas and a six pack or two pizzas and, you know, two, two, uh, uh, two liters of soda cost, that's 40 or 50 bucks right there every week. That's $200 a month just by not eating pizza on Friday nights. Yeah. 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 And and it doesn't. It doesn't have to be live with your in laws. It. I mean, I understand what you did. And I understand. I mean, there, there's lots of ways you can. There's lots of small ways you can trim your budget. That 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 are that aren't a big deal. I, I talk to my brother, and I really like Audible, and he listens to podcasts, and we talk about this, that, and the other thing. And he says, "Nope, I'm not spending fourteen dollars a month on Audible." Now, some people think of that as their education or whatever, but like, it's it's a bunch of little things that add up to bigger things. Right. And I think the key is if you can at least do it long enough to get yourself a little bit of reserves right. in order to be able to invest, then you'll be able to get financing through lenders. The other thing that is very powerful that I just don't want people to miss is the power of having a 401k. Right now, because of the CARES Act, the only time in history that I know of, they are allowing us to take $100,000 out of our 401k without paying the prepayment penalty or the, or the early withdrawal penalty that you would have on a 401k. So if you could have access to $100,000 of your retirement funds, especially if you're worried about the market correcting and, and losing that money, you can buy a lot of property for $100,000. So right. talk to your financial advisor. This is not financial advice. I don't have my licenses anymore at all. Um, but I think it could be a powerful tool if you say I don't have money and it's going to take me a long time to cut my expenses or I'm really living lean already. See where you might have unsourced, um, you know, capital that you can tap like that. Find where you have opportunity to find money, or partner with other people that maybe have a retirement fund and have money, and that's how you can kind of get started and also have something in reserves while you continue to cut your own expenses and, and expand your means. So, Anna, if somebody wanted to start investing with you, or, or at least wanted to work with you, um, and, and you know whether it's in a coaching capacity or an investment capacity, um, tell tell us a little bit about that. What you uh, mentioned that you're looking to open up your coaching uh, program to a couple new students. Sure. So you can email me at info at reimom.com or check out my website, which is reimom.com. I am launching a group coaching educational program in June where we talk about exactly these kind of things, how you can start today with small apartment buildings, going up to large apartment buildings, figuring out how to create a plan for yourself to navigate all of the different hurdles we're having in the economy, navigate how to find them, how to fund them, uh, get creative with financing um, and, and different lending sources. And so really it's designed to come, aside, come beside you and teach you and coach you through that process so that you can get in the game or, or step up the game. And then also we have a multifamily investing company where we invest in much bigger deals. So for those people that say, you know, I love real estate, but there's no way I'm going to get my hands dirty. I just don't have the time or the money, um, but I've got maybe some cash that I want to invest or maybe not, you know, pull it out of the stock market or invest with my IRA. 
we do have passive investment opportunities for investors that might be a good fit for some of your listeners. So if you're interested in that as well, email me at info at ariamom.com. We can have a conversation about your investment goals, your risk tolerance, and, and explain a little more to you about the bigger multifamily deals and how you can invest passively. That's great. That's great. Um, as always, if you're looking for um, if you're looking for financing from um, you know for your flips or for smaller, um, actually even larger uh, investments, you know I'm a hard money lender with hard money bankers. Uh, you can reach out to me for uh, a quote on any property or project you're looking at. Um, email me at hardmoneybankers.com or give me a call seven one seven two one three eight four eight eight. Judah. You got any? Yeah. any Listen, I, I just, I just uh, yeah. So my name is Judah Hooper. I'm an executive with Slate House Group. We manage about four thousand units across four states. We love helping people and working with investors. This uh, podcast and uh, Facebook Live is one of the ways that we try to give back to the investor community. If you liked us, be sure to check us out again. Josh and I do this every day at noon. You can like the real estate uh, hackers uh, community web page to check us out tomorrow. We're going to be doing a news wrap up. Typically what we do is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we cover a topic. This week was financing. Then on Thursday, we have a guest on to talk about that topic. And Friday, we talk about the news as it relates to realtors and real estate investors. Um, I'm not sure if we're starting next week on marketing, uh, but we are looking at doing at least one or two weeks on on marketing. So you want to come back and, and uh, tune in for that as well. Yeah, we'd, we'd love that. that. I mean, the marketing is going to take a while. Like, the, <laughs> there's so much information to talk about marketing that, uh, you know, it might take us a month. But we'll, we'll, we'll be back next, or we'll be back tomorrow. Yep, absolutely. See you, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Guys. Thanks, Anna.